please. Um, I do want to say a few words before we get started. You know, there are a few silver linings to this global pandemic, but I can say without hesitation that this semester's visiting artist guest list probably would not have been possible if we had been under normal conditions in Shemin Auditorium on campus. Uh, the honest truth is convincing this many exceptional artists to squeeze in a trip to Syracuse from their far-flung locales is highly improbable. But more importantly, I want to thank Castles and Jess Posner for putting together this superb collection of artists who have joined us this semester. I have been blown away by the authentic and unique voices we have heard from, and I feel so lucky to have been a part of the conversation with all of them. Next, just some words of support to our students, many of whom I know you've already ventured home and are joining us from all across the US. And for those of you still on campus, I wish you a safe journey home. I really have been enjoying your papers and hearing about what you have found most interesting in each of these lectures. So thank you for your thoughtful and open responses. I look forward to seeing all of you next semester back on campus. So please come visit me in the printmaking studios over at Comart and say hi. And now the piece de resistance. I am so eager for you guys to see the amazing work of our guest, Jackie Summel. So Castles, we all love your thoughtful and generous introductions. So please take it away. Thank you, Holly. It's true, we've made it through 12 weeks. This is the final lecture. And I want to thank Syracuse University. And I also wanted to thank you, Holly, teacher in ARM, as well as my co-teacher, Jess Posner, in the Art, Activism, and Modernity class for all your incredible work that you've been putting into this. Um, I also wanted to thank the students for embracing work that deals with the inequities of our time in a really courageous and imaginative way. So as we all know, we're in a very divided moment in this country. Some say it hasn't been this divided since the Civil War. Some could say it just always has been. But these wounds cleft deep. And as artists, we get to use our creative brains and spirits to manifest and heal. And that those tactics are more important now more than ever before. And you students, you guys are the future. And I really hope that you see yourself reflected and the gleam and the myriad of possibilities that have been modeled to you by the artists that we've brought through to this program. And we hope that you too can use your imagination, your body, your illustrations, your craft, your textiles, ceramic sound, film, photography, painting, gesture, and then performance and hell, even your life to generate art as a tool to inspire the change that you wanna see around you. So on that note, I'm, gonna, I'm very honored to present the work of the artist and activist, my dear homie, Jackie <laughs> Snow. And Jackie has asked me not to go all like, you know, academic and list all of her references because in addition to being an artist whose work I really respect, she is my friend. But I just like to talk a little bit about Jackie. I actually didn't really know of Jackie's work, I'm embarrassed to say, until about exactly one year ago. I had the honor of adjudicating the 2020 Creative Capital Awards and it was there amongst hundreds of applications that I came across Jackie's work and it really stood out like a piercing beam of light. Jackie's work struck me like a thunderbolt in the clarity of her vision. And in truth, I almost became in awe because Jackie has this ability to approach dark weighty subject matters such as solitary confinement, systemic racism, the prison industrial complex. And she also has this ability to alchemize the underbelly of profit driven sociopathic injustice into a rich fertilizer, which grows not just beautiful artworks, but she seeds ideas too. And Jackie is more than an artistic green thumb. She's attuned to the cosmos. She has a connection with spirit. And though it taxes her because the burden of this work is heavy, she is also a healer. Deep in the midst of In Plain Sight when Rafa and I were in the stress of it, I got this package from Jackie in the mail and she had sent us tonics and teas to calm our nervous system. For Jackie, self-care is community care. It's growing friendships and it's meeting you with compassion. And just as much as she, she has compassion within her personal in, in invest, investments with people, she also tills the soil with these ideas. She digs her fingers into the earth and she mines difficult spaces, sorting the worms from the gemstones with care. She cares so very deeply. And this care is expressed in all of her engagements as it extends to her fellow artists, with her community in New Orleans, with the children that she mothers, with the dogs that she adopts, and of course, with the gorgeous, the gorgeous gardens and plant medicines that she grows. 
So it seems really fitting that we end the Syracuse University IPS takeover visiting artist series with the possibility that is presented in Jackie's work. So without further ado, welcome Jackie. Oh, you really, you brought me to tears. Jackie, I'm sorry. You muted me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, I feel like if you were going to be generous enough to use that image, I had to, um, to play with it. Um, Castles and Jess and Holly and everyone who's here, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> that was an amazing and generous introduction. Um, and I think, you know, as we approach um the lecture and i want to really make sure that we bring in um gratitude at the very start um, all of my lectures um because i wouldn't be able to have these public facing conversations if it if it weren't for my elders if it weren't for the spirit and support of folks that we have systemically been caught taught to condemn um, and their investment their patience their tutelage and their, their love, their belief that we can and, and will live differently. Um, you know, I'm getting more and more used to the Zuminati and um, presenting myself to the world through this interface. But, you know, as an abolitionist, I do believe abolition begins with, with eye contact and there is a human and humane relationship that we're cultivating through the philosophy of abolition. And it's very hard, it's even harder through um, this interface. So I just wanted to see if we might explore, I'm gonna take off my real glasses. Um, we might explore uh, facilitating a little bit of human connection through the Zoom. Um, and if everybody, I know, ooh, so scary. If you might um, turn your videos on. Um, just just for a moment, y'all. It is a facilitation. You don't have to turn your audio on. We're just going to sort of see each other with eyes. Yeah, cool. Um, and if you click on the little icon that makes it possible, I know everybody's like, oh, no, it's OK. It's OK. Um, most of y'all are probably too young to know this reference, but it's a little bit like the Brady Bunch where you can sort of look up, look side to side and see the folks around you. Um, cool. And if you're on YouTube, I know you don't necessarily have the same experience of engagement, but you have um, the ability to see us interacting and then I invite you to participate in this facilitation also. So wherever you are, <clears throat> without judgment of self or so-called other, other, you are invited to just pause. So if you're busy, busy, busy cooking or doing or writing or whatever it might be, just take a moment, pause. The invitation is to place both feet on the floor, beneath you, on a chair, whatever it reaches. So you feel this kind of connection with what is below. And if you are able physically to extend your spine. You can extend your spine seated or standing. And then I, I invite you if you feel safe, even though with the videos on to go ahead and close your eyes and to take a holy moment just to breathe together. A couple of really nice inhales and exhales. A dear one, uh, Gibran, Gibran <clears throat> Rivera, a dear friend of mine says, if we breathe together, if we inhale, we inspire. If we exhale, we respire. And if we do it together, we conspire. And I love this idea because in the end, this is what we're doing. We are dreaming and building together. So just take a moment, settle. And then together through your noses, breathe in. Reach the top of that inhale and just pause. This is where inhale becomes exhale. Some magic happens, some alchemy. Breathe out. Two more like that, breathe in. Reach the top, pause. Breathe out. 
Last one like this, breathe in. Reach the top, pause. Even longer, breath out. Allow the breath to return to its normal rhythm. Keep the eyes closed for just a moment. As an engagement, I'm gonna invite us to, to share our expressions of a couple of prompts to be able to engage with each other, to transcend, you know, what is this digital interface? You're invited to be open, to be free, to be spirited, to maybe think of all of the walls and borders and impossibilities that we're being asked to transcend in a world gilded by white supremacy and heteronormativity. And to think of all of the ways we can be creative in our deep, deep, deep and most profound connection. And then to also invite a sense of wonder uh, and play. So with our eyes closed, I'm gonna call out a word. And after I call out the word, you'll express it with your hands, with whatever's around you, with your faces and pause. So it'll be like a freeze frame for 10 seconds and we'll just hold that pose. So we'll begin, inhale. And exhale. And then with the inhale, breathe in the word joy. And with the exhale, express it. Open your eyes and express what joy looks like. And then look at each other. So it's a freeze frame. And then look around. Wow, we gotta work on joy, you guys. We gotta work on joy. Okay, and then pause, close the eyes. We'll get a little bit more abstract. With the eyes closed, you're gonna breathe in the word freedom. And then with the exhale, open the eyes and express it in your computer. It's a freeze frame. So what does the first thing that comes to mind? What is freedom to you? Look around. Yeah. Okay, two more. Just release everything. Close the eyes. Breathe in together the word abolition. And with the breath out expression, open the eyes and peep out what everyone's doing. Your expression of abolition. Beautiful. And then for the last one, we'll close the eyes. And then <clears throat> breathe in 2020. And then as we breathe out an expression of 2020. And look around. Okay, so we share that experience that 2020 has been shit on shit for everybody. Thank you so much for playing with that. Everyone's like, quick, 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 quick. No more video, no more video. I do appreciate it, you guys. It's very helpful for me to see your faces and also um, to see each other, that we are real human beings and humans. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, and talking about this work. Beep, boop, beep, beep. Great. I'll get a thumbs up from Jess, who's the only one who didn't block their screen. Yeah, cool. Um, and just make sure that, um, you know, as a little reminder, I like to start off my lectures with the slide of the multiverse, um, because as we engage with these systems of punishment and control and all of the overwhelming reality of what it means to, um, to live in the colonized United States in a country that was gilded by white supremacy and, and the dreams of heteropatriarchy, um, that it feels impossible, especially as more and more of this reality is revealed. 
um, and expressed. And to remember that in the end, we are very, we're small um, relative to the multiverse. And Castle's brought in at the start, um, this notion of seeds. And we'll talk about them quite a bit in the in the next 40 minutes or so. But I do think if we look at the multiverse of possibilities and try to remember and embody the notion that we are just like a tiny seed, a tiny thought, a tiny idea that can grow into another multiverse of possibility, right? It's the acorn that makes the oak tree. So thank you. Um, and continuing to root um, this conversation in gratitude I spent the last 20 years of my life moving in and out of prisons, jails, and detention centers, um, mostly working with folks serving their sentences in long-term solitary confinement, most notably my elders, the Angola Three, um, Herman Wallace, Albert Wood Fox, and Robert King, without whom I wouldn't have the possibility of, of being here today. So all of my political and personal orientation comes from the great gift of their tutelage, their patience and love. I am here because of them. Um, is noted by their name. They are collectively known as the Angola Three because they spent decades in solitary confinement in a prison called Angola here in the state of Louisiana. Um, so Angola prison is uh, the largest prison in the colonized United States, 18,000 acres. Um, is former, which is an arguable term, plantation, slave plantation, named for the place in Africa where the initial colonizer Isaac Franklin thought the most profitable enslaved persons came from. So Louisiana was literally and figuratively made fat on the backs of sugarcane, one of the largest chattel crops, which also happened to be the bloodiest of all the chattel crops. Um, and the slave port of New Orleans is downriver <clears throat> of where all of these plantations were growing upriver of the Mississippi. Um, and so Isaac Franklin um, had this idea that he could breed enslaved bodies. He could bleed, breed chattel um, on the initial colonized land of Angola prison today, um, and then repopulate the, the, the cane fields um, with those beings. Um, <clears throat> today, Angola prison maintains its name and arguably its economic paradigm, 18,000 acres, every able body prisoner in Angola is forced to work to 20 cents an hour, a minimum of 40 hours a week. Um, there's about 6,000 able bodied men, as you can see in this very recent photograph. Um, in Angola, um, and about 78% of them are Black, um, all from the state of Louisiana, um, which if you don't know, the state of Louisiana imprisons more people per capita <clears throat> than any of the other U.S. counterparts. Um, and if we are first among U.S. states, then we are first in the world. I think the stats are that Louisiana incarcerates five times that of Iran, 13 times that of China, and something like 20 times that of any European country. So um, we are the greatest incarcerator in the world. And without assumption, I know we've had some amazing conversations and lectures, um, but I, you know, not to assume that anyone is anywhere in the conversation of mass incarceration. Um, we do know that the US as, as a whole maintains 5% of the world population and 25% of the world's prison population, disproportionately 25%, which is also oddly um, about the same uh, numbers that we get for COVID infections, 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's COVID infections. Um, at any given point, there's 2.5 million people. I'm sorry if I'm smiling, it's my dog is doing something stupid. There's 2.5 million people um, incarcerated at any given moment in our collective history. There's about 8 million under some form of correctional control um, and 13 million people moving in and out of prisons, jails, and detention centers every day. So that is one large European country um, that is, is somehow affected by our criminal punishment system every given day. Um, 
We also, I also want to make sure that we are aware that the 13th Amendment, which alleges to abolish slavery, intentionally makes an, an exception for those duly convicted of a crime. Um, and that the peculiar institution of chattel slavery, as it was once defined, has now morphed into the peculiar institution of hyperincarceration. Um, and so, you know, in the colonized United States, um, there is also, you know, this uh, uh, expected um, uh, evolution of chattel slavery into mass incarceration, where you see a predominantly brown and black disproportionate to the population, um, population of incarcerated folks. Um, I'm gonna to focus tonight's conversation around solitary confinement. A lot of folks, you know, when I started doing this work 20 years ago, um, didn't know what solitary was. Solitary confinement has many names, uh, nom de plumes, uh, ad seg, CCR, the hole, the shoe, the dungeon. Um, and, and part of that makes it really hard to litigate against it because it's called different things in different prisons, right? Um, in Angola, ad seg, um, excuse me, solitary was called CCR closed cell restriction. Um, and Herman Wallace spent 41 years in closed cell restriction. So that meant 41 years in a six foot by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day. Um, Robert King spent 29 years in solitary confinement, 23 and one, six foot by nine foot cell. And Albert Wood Fox spent 44 years in isolation, 44 years in six foot and nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day. Um, and so, you know, I position uh, this conversation and the sort of like scope of my work around our cultural responses to so-called crime and our notions of justice that celebrate punishment. And I'm hoping that through the work that so many of the artists who have spoken to y'all um, have included that we begin to see a paradigm shift in our cultural response to so-called crime. Um, and I think it's really important to think about it because this idea that punishment is the solution to so-called crime um, is written into our consciousness as much as our constitution, right? That 13th amendment. And I will say that just, I preface this um, and I will say so-called crime throughout the duration of this presentation because crime like gender, like race is fluid. Um, it changes over time. You know, a hundred years ago, I would have probably been um, burned at the stake for doing exactly what I do now, standing before you, you folks um, as a woman body person and telling you um, about notions of freedom, liberation, and abolition. Um, <clears throat> most of my answers um, uh, are organized around my friendship um, with this man, my Gator cousin, Herman Wallace, who, as I said, spent 41 years in isolation. Um, unfortunately, that number or statistic is not um, unique, but what is unique is the way that Herman Albert and Robert ascended, transcended, transformed, and changed from within the most imaginable circumstances, decades in isolation. Um, I was really blessed um, to spend 12 years collaborating with Herman um, on a project called The House That Herman Built, um, where Herman um, designed his dream home. So we collaborated on designing his dream home um, uh, and with the intention of building it here in the state of Louisiana. Um, and most of that collaboration and correspondence was through the lost art um, of letter writing, um, which is very significant and informs uh, the body and breadth of work that I'm gonna share with you. Um, but Herman and I literally uh, exchanged thousands of letters over the course of those 12 years. Um, and it was from Herman that I got um, to understand the implications and the experience of solitary confinement. Um, and these letters right now are on ex exhibit um, as part of the Bar Barring Freedom exhibition um, in San Jose. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, it was through Herman's lived experience that I began to create this exhibition, The House That Herman Built, 
um, and juxtapose uh, his reality to his imagination. Um, so I actually rebuilt Herman's cell based on his, his drawing, <clears throat> excuse me, his drawings and his written experience. So these are just gonna be a couple of images from different exhibitions. So you can see here, I'm sort of taking the identity or notations from her and then creating a 3D object that is six foot by nine foot that folks can engage with, you know, with the intention of not only illustrating what is wrong with systems of punishment and control, but what is possible um, and extending that <clears throat> through his imagination. As you can imagine, you know, Herman was my elder, uh, my closest elder. And every time I would rebuild his reality, that six foot by nine foot cell, it was just so emotional because I was in it and I was closer to Herman and Albert and Robert and Zulu and the 100,000 Americans, men, women, and children who are forced to endure the cruel and unusual punishment of solitary confinement. Um, so each time I built that six foot by nine foot cell, it became more and more clear to me that solitary confinement was arguably our most concentrated form of punishment um, and therefore our most important target for abolition. Um, Angela Davis often describes prisons as solitary confinement within our society, within our community. We don't see them, they're not there in our everyday we're able to forget them. And that is also a form of punishment to evaporate people from our consciousness. Um, and so if you can imagine if prisons are solitary within our societies, there's an even more concentrated form of punishment and therefore perhaps um, a more concentrated form of our socialized addiction to punishment and a more precise target for abolition. As many of you know, after 41 years of solitary confinement and wrongful conviction, uh, Herman was released on October 1st, 2013. Oh gosh, wasn't expecting that. He joined the ancestors just three days later <clears throat> on October 4th, 2013. On behalf of Herman, I, I ask that we don't allow the tragedy of this story to eclipse the miracle that Herman Wallace died free, innocent in the eyes of the law um, and surrounded by those of us who loved him most. I know some of you are on <clears throat> the YouTube watching. Um, so thank you so much. You know, I was totally devastated. I live in Louisiana because of Herman and Albert. You know, I moved here to be able to advocate on their behalf um, and, and more effectively. And so it was a great loss for many. Um, but I had, the, I had the unusual gift of Herman's letters. So I, I had thousands and thousands of letters um, that I was able to hold and to reread and to revisit. and. You know, in the wake of his loss of his ascendance, I was able to really see the letters differently and, and recognize for the first time how much Herman talked about flowers um, and gardens. And in fact, when I asked him, what kind of house does a man who's <laughs> lived? I don't know if you could hear my dogs, they're playing. Hold on one second. Can you guys stop? Okay. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> My dog was just howling. I'm home alone. Okay. Um, when I asked Herman, what kind of house does a man who's lived in a six foot by nine foot cell for 30 years dream of? He said, I could clearly see the gardens and I wish for guests to be able to smile and walk through gardens all year round. Um, and so, you know, the, he was constantly dreaming of gardens. So I knew that there was something in gardens um, that would be a way to uphold Herman Wallace's life and legacy. But, but to that point, when I asked him that question, which launched our project, you know, the first thing he asked for were his gardens. And the second thing he asked for um, was a swimming pool with a light green bottom and a large black panther in the center. So Herman, Albert and Robert are all panthers. 
Um, so yeah, it is priority straight. I just want to say when questions come in, I can't see them, um, but I will hopefully answer them towards the end of this conversation. So disoriented by the immense grief, grief of losing Herman, you know, I um, had the opportunity to go back and see how much, um, as I said, he got, he talked about flowers and gardens. And in fact, Herman would spend 12 to 16 hours um, a, a day sometimes making these paper flowers um, for myself and for other, um, other people who advocated for him. Um, and I feel like these paper flowers, you know, all he had was white paper and colored pencils. And he created this pattern that he would cut out with his sharpened thumbnail over and over and over again, because they wouldn't give him scissors um, or cutting devices. And then he would use toothpaste and water and, um, you know, roll up the paper that he colored green, tie his dental floss around it and then create the stems um, as you know, a longing and expression of longing to be back with flowers after 41 years of concrete and steel. Um, so with the intention of upholding his life and his legacy and continuing to illustrate the inhumanity of solitary confinement, I started the Solitary Gardens, which uses Herman Wallace cell, that six foot by nine foot cell is sort of the foundation to grow gardens. Um, <clears throat> the solitary gardens are principled on the tenets of abolition and permaculture and art. And they facilitate these exchanges between folks who are still in isolation and volunteers on the outside. So here you can see Herman's, it's like a cross section of Herman's cell with the toilet sink, the bed, the desk, um, the, the gate at the front. And the only place that we can grow plants is where the human being can physically move, right? Excuse me. So each one of these six by nine garden beds maintains that same standard blueprint of an isolation cell grown with our collaborators inside known as solitary garden gardeners through that lost art of letter writing. So we share with them growing almanacs and uh, images, exchanges, um, <clears throat> photographs of the gardens and they tell us what to grow. Um, so we're translating um, prisoners imaginations into the ground. You can see here that kind of interaction between different folks asking us to grow different things. Um, this is the garden bed at UCSC. Um, I just want to share a little excerpt from it, um, which I think is so beautiful. This is um, Tim Young. Uh, Tim has been on death row for 21 years now um, at San Quentin State Prison in California. And UCSC is growing this garden for two years. Um, and it's been the most magnificent and beautiful relationship for me to watch from the outside. But Tim says, you enter the gardens flanked by daisies, but the heart of the garden is filled with daffodils. In this way, I'm saying I turn daisies into daffodils. I used to pick flowers as a summer job and daffodils bring back memories of both youth and freedom. So in many ways, the solitary gardens have become public portraits of those who we are condemned, who uh, our society condemns to be forgotten, those buried deepest in our institutions of punishment and control. As I said at the beginning, abolition is written into the tenants of the solitary gardens. So it's really important that we see these prison cells turn garden beds crumble, that we see them disappear. And I'm really playing with our implicit bias that if we see this happen somewhere in our deep, deep, deep way of thinking, we think it's possible um, to live in a landscape without them. <clears throat> you can see in the background of this image that I'm growing sugarcane on site, um, also growing tobacco and cotton um, and so um, the garden beds themselves are made out of this, what I call revolutionary mortar, um, which is an invention of sugarcane, cotton, tobacco, and non-hydraulic, a natural, um, non-harmful lime. 
they're fully organic, you know, sort of offsetting the carbon footprint of prisons, concrete and steel um, with this revolutionary mortar that we mix in prayers and spells and wishes and all of these things, and then tamp it down to create the blueprint of a solitary cell. So in this way, we're using the largest chattel slave crops to build the walls of these prison cells turned garden beds with the intention of illustrating the evolution of chattel slavery into mass incarceration. Um, and so this current iteration of the solitary gardens, you know, sort of has this placemaker at the front using concrete and aluminum that I fabricated those, um, the, uh, the garden gates and, you know, it's really beautiful when you see them overcome with nature. Many of the solitary gardeners will choose different vines to grow up the prison cells. Um, and, you know, my thinking behind having the concrete uh, facing gate was that until we can fully eradicate these systems of <clears throat> torture, modalities of torture, we can't erase them um, um, from our landscape. Um, and that we are bringing them from the prisons um, to the foreground. This is an abolitionist park in the middle of, of the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Um, as you'll see in a second, we have garden beds all over, not only at UCSC, but at Xavier University, um, in Philadelphia, in New York, um, in Rhode Island. So I, <clears throat> in 2018, retrofitted this ambulance to be a prison abolition vehicle and took um, the solitary gardens on the road. <clears throat> At this point, I had been playing air guitar with solitary confinement for about 16 years. Um, and so myself and my co-pilot who spent five years in isolation um, had the opportunity. So the lived experience of being in solitary had the opportunity to build garden beds um, in Philly, as I said, in Providence, Rhode Island, in Houston. This is on the right is a reclaimed prison in North Carolina, um, Xavier University, and on the rooftop of the Lower East Side Girls Club, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think this slide is so important because you could see Rod who spent <clears throat> five years in isolation talking to Colin Kaepernick um, and, oh my goodness, I just blanked on his name, Eric Reed. Um, and, and in case you think I'm humble bragging about this image, there is like, absolutely nothing humble about it. Um, it was an incredible opportunity to speak with Colin Kaepernick about abolition um, through the lens of the solitary garden. So to be able to not only talk to him about what has led us to complicity in these, in the, in these systems of punishment and control, but all of the ways we can transcend and dream beyond them. Okay. So the success of that tour, like growing a garden has inspired new iterations that I don't necessarily feel I need control over. Some of them I do, um, but much like just offering and planting seeds, it's so beautiful for me to see all of these new gardens growing um, and new ideas growing on their own. Um, <clears throat> And so, um, and, and those are tenets of, of abolition. Um, ab prison abolition hinges on the possibility of evolution, of evolving the human being that has been condemned to the arguably worst mistake of their lifetime. Um, so in 2018, again, I had the opportunity to work with Project Row House um, and transform one of their houses, this is Houston, Texas, into a grow house. Um, and so the bunk beds mimic that of a prison dorm. And we, um, well, Project Grow House and myself, grew 12 flowers that were able to survive the environment in, in New York and survive the environment um, in Louisiana. Um, and, and that's how we ended up with those 12 flowers. Um, and so these flowers were grown here and then placed in a garden <clears throat> for incarcerated mothers as part of the Persister Show in Newcomb, Newcomb, excuse me, museum here in New Orleans. Um, and so the mom, so, you know, um, there was about 77, I think, um, women 
uh, incarcerated at St. Gabe here in Louisiana who are serving LWAPs or life without the possibility of parole. Um, sometimes we reframe that and we say death by incarceration. Um, so nothing shy of a miracle, they will spend the rest of their lives um, incarcerated. Um, and so working with those women <clears throat> to choose one of the flowers to represent them. We have, we built this garden um, and then I love this part so much. Um, and then created seed packets of those 12 flowers for visitors to the exhibition to take with them, plant themselves, and then send us back photographs of those flowers growing. And then we use FlickShop, which is a prisoner postcard system to send images of those flowers growing to the moms who chose them. And so in this way, they get to see themselves planted outside of prisons, um, see themselves growing around the country. Okay. So following the laws of nature as an ethos, I believe will provide us um, for solutions to the problems that we have, we as human beings have created, you know, solutions to the climate crisis, mass incarceration, environmental racism, sexism, and the laws of nature greatly inform the work of abolition. <clears throat> With all of these garden beds and projects booming all over the country, you know, question I get again and again is, well, what do you do with all the stuff growing in there? Um, this is Chopper's mother, who has since uh, transcended, and his sister. Um, Chopper's one of our solitary gardeners. And um, Ellen and Mary would come on occasion and uh, harvest with us some of the plants from Chopper's garden. Our neighbors take some, the volunteers. So we have one person paired with one solitary gardener. Very often we'll take whatever they're growing home. Um, it's a beautiful relationship where, you know, um, Anna was growing with Jesse. Um, whatever she would cook from the solitary garden, she would send pictures to Jesse so he would see his plants um, being used. Um, but there was still such an abundance of plants and, um, and possibility that in 2018, I started experimenting with some of the stuff in folks' gardens and making plant medicine. So I was just tinkering um, and experimenting. Um, and that eventually led me to go to herb school. So I, I went to Samara School of Community Herbalism <clears throat> and began a, a, a massive collaboration um, where now Samara School of Community Herbalism has students who are paired with incarcerated individuals who are learning through proxy relationships, again, letter writing um, about plants and plant medicine, healthcare sovereignty. Um, and with the intention that we are now growing solitary gardens that are full of plant medicine and building out um, a, a prisoner's apothecary. Um, and so I just jumped over the slide, but you can see here some of the drawings um, where folks who are incarcerated are designing gardens that uh, would have necessitated or prevented their own incarceration. So the herbs are actually intended for withdrawal symptoms and anxiety symptoms. But the prisoner's apothecary um, is the next iteration or uh, outgrowth of this work. Um, <clears throat> and so over the last year or so, um, we've created an entire apothecary of plant medicine grown and designed by folks who are still inside, um, which I think is such a, a beautiful action because in this way, many of those folks have the unique opportunity to heal the communities they're often accused of harming. Um, and I think that really asks us to transcend American perceptions of criminality, of value, of worth, of restitution, and of redemption. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip these next two slides um, and hopefully it'll come up in the Q and A. Um, but the prisoner's apothecary will take the teas, tinctures and herbs um, on the road with an upgraded version of, of the garrison. So this is the van that I'm now retrofitting with the help of Creative Capital, which I'm so grateful for because it was the link to meet Castles, who I also had an art crush on and was just like, wow, all my worlds are coming together. This is amazing. 
Um, so this dope ass camper was supposed to set sail this year. Of course, like many things has been grounded by COVID-19. Um, but the idea is that myself and another herbalist or formerly incarcerated person will drive the van around and set up public facing workshops at the intersection of healthcare sovereignty, of plant medicine and of abolition. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, in its trial run, I just wanna call in my dear one, uh, Amanda Wiles. You could see here, there's like, it's very practically fit so that we can make plant medicine and share plant medicine. Um, also calling in, I wanted to introduce you guys to one of my biggest teachers. <clears throat> this is Biden's Pilosa, um, which is crazy irony considering um, the president elect right now, but this plant um, steady kept me out of the hospital um, in August of 2020. Um, it is considered a weed. It's like uh, the southern, southeastern version of a dandelion. It grows everywhere in the cracks of sidewalks, along roadsides. You see fields of it. Um, it is uh, a, a plant that most folks are uh, trying to remediate or get rid of, um, very easy to look over. Um, but this this weed or so-called weed just has so much power. Um, I used it to treat MRSA, which is a, a antibiotic resistant staph infection, um, which <clears throat> was getting to be life-threatening, but it is antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, um, anti-malarial, it's good for hypertension, it's just packed with medicine. And I think that it's such a good teacher because from Biden's, we can see the framework for abolition in recognizing the potential of the plant um, rather uh, than the socialization of weed, right? We can invest in its value and our cultural relationship to it um, and also learn from its survival strategies. Um, so Biden's, they also are called beggar's ticks or blackjack or cobbler's pegs or Spanish needles, Biden, two teeth. Um, they shoot off thousands of seeds um, and they have these little teeth on them that sort of grab onto your socks and your pants or whatever so they could travel as far as you um, or your pet. And so um, part of uh, in listening and watching the way that they strategize around these seeds, it's really informed the next project that I, I want to share with you. But to Castle's point, you know, um, there's a Buddhist saying that everything arises from the tip of your intention, like the whole world arises from the tip of intention. And so there's like so much power packed in the smallest thing in the seed, which is antithetical to capitalist thinking, right? In capitalism, they want us to be the biggest, the best, to have the most, um, to do the most. And it's actually um, in watching the plants in my garden that I realized the power in being small. Um, and so that has informed the next project, which is um, the prisoner's apothecary cart. So you met the apothecary, now there's the apothecary cart. So we've gotten a little bit smaller um, listening to the emergent strategies of seeds um, and plants like Biden. And so here we are developing and designing these multiple herbal medicine carts um, that seed possibility through the same idea that intersection of healthcare sovereignty and abolition or radical vitalism and abolition. Um, and then we're gonna seed storytelling um, and possibility or public facing conversation aimed at solutions for a more humane equitable and just society. I'm really pumped about these. I'm getting super excited. So these little carts will be filled with plant medicine from the apothecary. The apothecary carts will be public um, and be able to be deployed to multiple places where folks who maybe don't have healthcare access or aren't able to have these conversations around plant medicine <clears throat> um, can access it for free. Um, they'll also be stocked with these dope um, shareable abolition field guides. So for me, what feels super important is not thinking of abolition as a destination, but abolition as a philosophy. And so what does that mean, the little a abolition? Where does abolition begin? And how do we embody it as a philosophy and as a lifestyle? 
Um, so, so ways to engage with it that way. Um, and they are in process, they are real, they are not just CAD drawings. Um, and um, the students at Tulane Small Center are working on them even as I am doing this presentation here. Um, and this collaboration also generated the possibility for the last project I'll share with you, um, which is an outgrowth. So you have the seeds all the way up to the field. Um, and the field of Bidens is manifesting in the prisoner's apothecary cafe. Um, and so we met the apothecary, the apothecarts, and I'll finish talking about the prisoner's apothecary cafe, which is a collaboration with the same students. Um, and so here I am working in a space called Ray, Resurrection After Exoneration, which you can see here, two of my elders, Albert Woodfox and John Thompson. So John Thompson started Ray after 14 years of solitary confinement, wrongful conviction on death row here in the state of Louisiana, eight stays of execution. Um, he had his conviction overturned. It was a, a wrongful conviction. He was exonerated, which is not the case for many of the folks I work with or a requirement. Um, I don't need innocence. Um, and I hope you don't either in order to give a fuck about each other. Um, but JT came home and he started this organization, which was a place for returning citizens to land. And the bottom floor was uh, kind of like a multi-use uh, activity space. Um, JT joined the ancestors in 2018. No, so excuse me, my God, 2017, <clears throat> just a day before the anniversary of Herman's ascendance. Um, and the space has been vacant since. And so the idea is that we'll retrofit resurrection after exoneration to become the prisoner's apothecary cafe, which will offer coffees, herbal teas, um, plant-based food um, designed by incarcerated individuals in collaboration with returning citizens who are employed here gainfully. Um, and in the back of the Apothecary Cafe will be a space for the Samara School of Community Herbalism, who will offer uh, free workshops and school um, for folks who are returning. Um, it's just, it's crazy to even say this out loud. So my hope is that it creates the space for, you know, the kind of cataclysmic cultural shifts that I believe we need um, to create deep human connections between um, all of the diverse um, folks that are populating our streets, right? If we uh, believe in abolition and decarceration, then we actually have to rub elbows with the folks um, that we were once told to fear. Um, so we're in the planning stages of this. I know I'm running out of time. Um, we can skip that one. <clears throat> and I'll just finish up here um, and encourage all of us to think of abolition as a philosophy. Um, not a destination. For me, abolition begins with eye contact. Um, and my work at its very best asks us uh, to continue growing ideas of abolition and to continue sharing. Um, and I really, you know, the garden for me has just been a profound teacher. And I think in the end, I'm really asking us to engage with the garden, with nature, um, with things that are alive um, as teachers to teach us how to be better humans. <clears throat> Plants historically have been part of the resistance. They have communicated ideas of freedom and liberation. These are photos actually of choppers, okra many, many moons ago. Um, and the seeds of okra were said to have made its way to the colonized United States braided into the hair of the enslaved body as they struggled to survive um, the forced middle passage. And then they were planted on the colonized land of what we now call the United States. And, and those yellow flowers became beacons um, for enslaved folks that were kept at different plantations to know that their people <clears throat> were living and surviving and, and arguably thriving in other <clears throat> plantations. <clears throat> and so in some ways, um, I do believe that plants are critical to collective healing. Um, 
And solution, plants you know, have been used as solutions for human inventions throughout time. This is an image of the Victorian clock garden prior to time telling, telling pieces, certain flowers would tell us what time it was. So Victorians would grow these big gardens and know it was 5 a.m. because the dandelions were blooming or morning glory at seven or mouse here at ear at eight or mallow at nine. Um, flowers have been used for communicating secret messages as in the cryptological communication called floriography, um, the language of flowers. So it became a mechanism for, um, bouquets became a mechanism for um, sharing um, secret messages often with um, forbidden lovers. Um, but in floriography, the language of flowers, <clears throat> Um, Rudbeckia herta, which is the black eyed Susan is the symbol of justice. Um, and I often think of that, um, you know, wandering the streets of New Orleans where it grows wild. Gardens have become incredible storytellers through our home gardens, our lives, our neighborhoods, our resistance, our self-determination. And so it feels to me a logical extension that plants can also carry the voices of human beings. We are systemically told to condemn and that plants can actually provide us with a map towards abolition. <clears throat> and I hope very much that this work, this talk, this conversation inspires us to listen to plants and the stories that they tell for solutions to the so social crises that we as human beings have created. Um, I usually finish here with a big hurrah about being social landscapers and engaging with abolitionists <clears throat> thinking and the how to's and where to go's. Um, but tonight I really want to shout out my homies talk this evening um, at 8.30, no wait, 9.30 Eastern, <clears throat> uh, Rafa Esparza, who is the co-founder, <clears throat> co-conspirator of In Plain Sight with Castles. Um, that talk will be available through the Hammer Museum and UCLA Department of Art. Um, amazing people, so humbled, so honored um, to work with them. And I left a little place here um, to see, I can't see you castles, but if you feel like at six, well, you're 7.30 Eastern Standard, if I should talk a little bit about my relationship with IPS or if we should leave it for the class and we finish up on that last slide. You're muted. <sighs> um, Holly, what do you think? Holly is usually the one that orchestrates this section. Holly, what do you think? Um, you know, I know that the students are going to have hundreds of questions for you, and and so I would love to to just get let them get started picking your brain if you don't mind. No, I actually need like a little bit of break of talking so it'd be really nice to get some feedback and hear from them at this point okay so i'm going to ask the students to start loading them questions in the chat and then jackie i'll do my best to um to kind of sort through them as they come up i might need you to stop screen sharing okay i don't know i haven't done it like that before um we're already having some questions come in so um, let's see, where are they coming? Okay, uh, let's see. Well, our very first question is coming from a YouTube viewer um, who wants to know, can you speak more to the relationship between art, storytelling, et cetera, and realized policy shift? Big A, abolition, what is your interest, responsibility, and capacity as an artist between the two? That's a big, that's a big question. Um, <clears throat> But I'll speak to it not through my work, but through the work of others, because I think that, you know, artists are charged. Well, let's start here. I think that, you know, one of the first um, targets of the oppressor is our imagination. I think if if they capture our imagination, they tell us what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. They tell us what freedom is, what freedom looks like. Um, and the imagination can transcend all of that, right? And <clears throat> I believe we saw that through um, 
Herman's, Herman's ability to leave his cell and design his dream home. You know, he always said, or often said, um, you know, that his physical body was in Angola, but he was more free than um, most of the free, so-called free folks that are in my circle. Um, and so imagination is a superpower. And I think that, you know, I'm an artist. I'm, I'm not a, a, a legislator and I'm not a lawyer and, you know, I'm not a banker, but I think, um, I think no matter what your, your job is or your so-called discipline, you can't let it discipline you that we all need to aim our, um, to sharpen our aim towards the same target, which is, you know, equity and liberty and freedom for all. And we all carry that responsibility. It's just that we might have different ways of doing it. Um, another elder of mine says it more eloquently, Walimu Johnson. He would say, it takes all the tiny grains of sand to hold back the oceans of oppression. And so it's not me, it's not you, it's us, right? It's we. And, you know, I teach this class in the value of being an artist during such contentious and visibly violent times and whether or not there can be quantifiable change. And to that person, I would say to look at the work of Lenny Riefenstahl, um, who was a German filmmaker who took a short, uh, awkward, nervous, losing candidate who was afraid of horses, afraid of the dark, afraid of blood. <clears throat> and through the artwork, <clears throat> of their filmmaking, which was arguably groundbreaking, whether or not we like the outcome, was able to elevate that neurotic losing candidate um, into power. Um, and that, that was uh, Adolf Hitler. But it was an artist who was able to, to really shift the perspective and the relationship and, and folks could invest in that. And, and there's a history of artists being a part in fundamental structural change. I mean, I don't want to pat myself on the back here, but, you know, Herman died free. <laughs> and, you know, when I had the amazing opportunity to first be introduced to him, I'd say there was nine people on the planet outside of his blood relatives who knew his name, you know, and now there's hundreds of thousands. And I think art played a part in that. That is amazing. Um, Many people are asking in the chat, what, how is your work received? What are some of the reactions? Uh, you guys tell me that. How did you receive my work? You know? <laughs> um, okay, so I've been doing this a long time, 20 years, which is fucking insane. But <clears throat> so you can imagine there's a myriad of, of reactions some of the most meaningful, um, you know, I, I had never seen anybody cry at an exhibition until 2007, where I had my first sort of like introduction, where the first time I rebuilt Herman's cell. Um, and I knew that it was powerful and I knew that I could work as a, a Trojan horse because folks who, you know, are never forced to think about these conditions of punishment and control and cruel and unusual conditions were then forced to engage with it. Um, but I, I, I think it's a disservice to leave them there. You know, you also have to give them a seed of hope and possibility. And Herman did that, you know, Jackie didn't do that. Jackie just was able to be a conduit, but Herman offered so much hope and possibility. Um, in his ability to transcend these impossible conditions. But I also had, you know, like when the film came out, Herman's House, I had to um, assume a moniker on social media because there were death threats um, and people who, you know, said and, and did very terrible things. And, um, and so there's, you know, thanks. That's how I know that it's working, you know, is that it has affected folks um, to, to action, whether or not I want all of the action, yeah. Here's a beautiful question. When 
about did you have your spiritual awakening coming to consciousness of your surroundings and worldly matters? And how did you react to this initially? So, you know, one of my elders says, you know, I keep saying my elders, but look, I'm pretty blessed um, with teachers. You're either in a disaster <clears throat> or you're in between disasters. Um, and so how you live your life in between disasters really matters. And it was a collision of tremendous disasters that was the catalyst um, for my spiritual awakening. Um, and that was the death of my mom, um, the loss of my beloved city in Katrina, um, and um, finding out that my partner <clears throat> was having an affair. This is before I was poly, so, you know. <laughs> Back in the heteronormative structure of shit shows, um, all of that happening within the span of about two weeks, you know, it was like a crazy, like, boom, boom, boom. And I was like, oh, I, I get it. Life is suffering. Like, this is impossible. But shit, man, like, I always had this, this reference. I'm like, you know, the humans I love the most always had it harder than me. And so having this kind of relationship that was so grounding and generous um, with them was remarkable to my own spiritual evolution. <clears throat> I, I also, you know, um, when Walimu passed, which was uh, on the 17th, three years ago, uh, Walimu Johnson, Walimu means teacher in Swahili. And when he passed, it was real hard because, you know, I would, Walimu was home and I would sit on the foot of his bed and just like chop it up. And anytime I had an issue, I, that's where I'd go, you know? And when he passed, you know, I brought the news into Wood Fox, who was at the county jail at that time. Wood Fox was still inside. And I was weeping so hard. I was weep, just weeping, like you know, talking to Wood Fox through um, the metal grate. And just because, you know, I was suffering. And to the point where the correctional officer came in and said, what did he do to you? You know, and... I was like, no, man, we just we just lost our homie. And, you know, I remember Wood Fox let me cry. And then I, I kind of came up for air and I made eye contact with him. And he said, I bet the funeral will be beautiful. And it was just this way where he took me from my pain and pity and just was like, boop you get to go to the funeral, you know, just like one moment of grounding without making me feel like shit because I wasn't recognizing that he couldn't. Right. And that was his homie too. And it's like those moments that for me um, have been my um, the kind of handlebars, you know, like monkey bars and just like, where am I going? How am I going to do this? And then the, the, the most incredible human beings, and human doings uh, are have been part of my life. You know, I sometimes talk about it, like now I feel like I'm rambling, that um, the way that we make um, diamonds, which we think of as like such a, a precious stone and material is just like oh, taking carbon, which we are mostly made out of and oh, oh, all this pressure, 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 pressure. And then you can end up with a diamond or you can end up with coal, right? And the prison system is the same thing. Oh, 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 pressure, 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 pressure. And very often it destroys folks. I'm associating that with coal, but sometimes, man, you just, it's diamonds. And I've had the incredible fortune of meeting so many diamonds, you know? And that really has been central to my spirituality and practice. Yeah. Uh, I know Castles has a question for you. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Jackie. Actually, Jackie, this is from Rafa. Mm -hmm. um, he texted me and wanted me to ask this to you. He says, Jackie, thank you. I love you. I really appreciate you discuss scale in your strategies that you've initiated through your creative practice to imagine and do abolition. Seeing and hearing you talk about your different projects, 
and the different iterations and manifestations of work that centers and innovates systems of care inspired work that often at times feels daunting and helpless because you are right, we are tiny systems in this enormous and your abolitionist journey as a creative badass, how do you sustain your work, especially in a time that is constantly violently being taken from us? Mm. Thank you, Rafa. <clears throat> I can't wait to hear you answer that question. Um, you know, I think I partially answered it with the last question is that I, I always have a reference point that is bigger than me. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm in New Orleans, we flood a lot. <clears throat> and I, one time it was flooding and, and there was a, like a big railroad tie that was floating down in the street in front of my house. And I like ran into the, the flood water and grabbed it. Cause I was like, oh, that's a great barrier for the garden. And while I was doing that, you know, one of my housemates came out and joined me. And then suddenly I was like, ow, 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 what is that? What is that? Cause I just saw kind of like this form floating in the, in the water. And I thought it was, you know, whatever, just dirt. And it turns out that it was fire ants. Um, and it was the way that they were surviving the flood was they hold on to each other and they take turns constantly moving, constantly moving, constantly moving to get air um, in the water. And that's how I live my life, you know, is that I'm holding on to my community. I'm holding on to each other. And sometimes like I'm up there breathing and I'm able to keep everybody going. And sometimes I'm underwater, but I know damn straight like that I have this whole army of people who I've intentionally built my life around that will pull me up when I need air again. Um, and that has been put to the test in 2020, you know? Um, and so I think that's the only way to do this. And, you know, there, I'm going to out myself here. You, you probably already figured it out, but um, there's this um, teacher Satchitanda, who is said to have been teaching once and they, and, and somebody, some, some, some person asked, so what are you, what are you, what are you, like, are you a Hindu or like, what, what is this yoga stuff? What are you teaching? Is this, is this is you're speaking in Hindu? And he said, no, I'm not a Hindu. I'm an undo. And I think that is critical to the way that we live the world, that we are constantly undoing the constructs of individuality and racial capitalism. And we're constantly having to check ourselves and let go of this to build and actually exist within the world that we wish to see. Yeah, yeah. And th that goes back to the Buckminster Fuller quote that you started with, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That leads to this question. What would your ideal version of society look like, the conceptual end goal? I mean, I don't, this might sound brash, but I feel in some ways I live it in, in, in micro um, existence. Um, it is based on mutual aid and accountability and, you know, a robust fucking ability to love each other. Um, and to love the complexity of each other. And it, and I know that could sound super woo woo, um, but that's because of capitalism. And if it was fucking easy to love each other robustly, we would just do it, right? It's hard, that is the hard work. And that is what I learned from Herman, you know what I mean? Like I didn't learn that um, in a yoga class. I learned that from a Revolutionary who spent 41 years in solitary confinement for a crime he couldn't possibly commit. That's who taught me how to love, you know? And if he could do it, I feel responsible to do it too. Yeah. Jackie, are there organizations that are effectively fighting against solitary confinement? I know the Southern Poverty Law Center does work with criminal justice reform, but are there other organizations that you're aware of that you'd be their partner with or that? they know about your work or you know about them? Yeah, for sure. Um, the Vera Institute is doing some really important and amazing work down here. So there's a Louisiana Stop Solitary Coalition um, that's doing great work. And <clears throat> the sort of large scale is the Vera Institute. Um, 
there is, I don't, you know, cake in New York. I'm just thinking what's New York based. C-A-I, C-A-I-C. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but they have been targeting solitary confinement and have built replicas of my cell and done film screenings of Herman's house. I'm um, doing amazing work. Um, Five Molimwak runs an organization called Incarcerated Nation up in New York that's doing really good work. And, you know, um, let's like just shout out um, Critical Resistance and Ruthie Gilmore and Angela Davis and the work that the foundations that they laid for us to be able to have these conversations. Um, and CR still exists and I'm pretty sure there's a chapter, you know, a, a handshake away from where y'all are, yeah. And if not, start one. What advice would you give your younger self? Your audience is up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> younger people here. Oh my gosh. My younger self. <clears throat> you know, I still deal with this today, and I, I know this is part of. <clears throat> This is something I'm gonna to have to deal with the rest of my life. Um, but it's, you know, still wrestling with an imposter syndrome and like whether or not um, there is value in what I have to offer the world. And I played um, division one soccer and I was uh, um, back in the 1900s. And I think I, I mean, at one point there was a recruiter from the national team who came to my high school. And I think I had a pretty good shot of, of going that far or maybe playing professional soccer. But um, I lacked the confidence in myself to do it, um, for sure. I was always second guessing myself. And I feel like that really feeds into um, the imposter syndrome. And so what I would tell <clears throat> little Jackie is, you have everything you need um, and that's it. Like you got this. And, and I will say that to everybody on this, um, as everyone who's part of this conversation is that we have everything we need just told by a system that is looking to profit from us in big and small ways that we need more or we don't have it. And that's a big fat lie y'all, yeah. Right, that's the drives capitalism. We don't have it. Um, you mentioned you moved to L Louisiana because of your elders. Can you speak to your story of in, in your introduction to their lives, your introduction to their lives, and vice versa? Sure. This is, I know we're running out of time. This will be a good one to end with. Um, so. This path is really unexpected and it is a lot of undoing, you know, a lot of saying no to things that I thought were valuable or would make me valuable or were important. Um, and, a, and a lot of like interpersonal <clears throat> disagreements. Um, and so in the early 2000s, I had gotten into grad school at Stanford and I would argue that it was the first time that my, you know, my family was like, yeah, that's my daughter, you know, whatever. Like the first time that they were like claiming me. And, um, and I, you know, was like on a particular path in a particular direction. Um, and, and that direction was to be an artist, a successful artist. Um, but I had a crush, which I will tell you that, you know, it's very rare that you'll have professors in art school um, that will, will tell you to challenge, you know, the art world, which is also gilded by white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. And it's not made for all of us. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a bitter pill to discover that, you know, somewhere in the middle of, of your commitment to, um, getting your MFA. But there I was, you know, thinking I was doing everything right. And someday I was going to be the shining light in the art world, whatever. And um, I had a crush on this organizer who said, hey, there's this guy who's going to be 
speaking at the luggage store gallery in San Francisco, you know, he just spent 29 years in solitary confinement uh, for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed in a state called Louisiana in a, a prison called Angola. Do you want to go? And all I heard was, do you want to go? You know, and I was like, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I don't know. It was like 2001. Um, so before Michelle Alexander's like book brings these public conversations around mass incarceration, I didn't even know what solitary confinement was, you know? And then on my way there, I was biking. San Francisco is really hard to ride your bike. I was biking uh, down Market Street and I got cut off by this SUV. And um, I, I like threw my bike down and pulled out my earrings. And I'm like, fuck you, you gas guzzling motherfucker. And just like screaming at this person who may or may not have seen me, you know? And then I uh, like fixed my hair, reapply my makeup, put my earrings back in, walked up the stairs of the luggage store gallery and then sat in front of a man who had spent 29 years longer than I had been alive in a six foot by nine foot cell for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed in a prison called Angola in a state called Louisiana. Um, and he wasn't angry. And I was like, shit. Like it was a moment that was just like, I almost went fisticuffs with a total stranger who may or may not have saw me, you know what I mean? And here's this man who has spent uh, more time than I had been alive in a cage for something he didn't do. And he's not pissed. Like he's not visibly crazy. He's not angry. I have something to learn from him. Yeah. And that was, that was really the beginning of this journey was, you know, the availability of what, of suffering. I was suffering. I was fighting with everyone all the time, you know, and this, you know, longing to live differently and, and to see peace embodied, oh my gosh, I'm crying again, but to see peace embodied in a human being who had suffered far worse than I um, was enough to just change everything. And here I am today. <laughs> and, and has the anger subsided? Or lessened. Um, mostly, mostly. Um, I will say, you know, there's a combination of things that I have been learning and um, and I practice so that I don't I don't flip my cool, whatever. Um, but at the heart, at the center of it all, is wonder. Like I, I wonder how I could be better. I wonder how I could do better. I wonder what else I, I wonder how I could love more. I wonder how I could be kinder faster. And then it's just, you know, experimenting and playing and trying from there. Yeah. So less frustration. No, I'm still frustrated as fuck. I mean, how can you not be, you just be slightly awake, you know? And, but now I have different tools to transmute it. And, and, and that's what I learned, you know, from Herman Albert and Robert, I learned how to take it and make it something else. And that's what they did from solitary confinement. And that's why the prison kept them in solitary for so long, because they had that superpower, right? And so we're going to be frustrated the rest of our lives. This is an unfair, unjust world that we have created through our complicity or direct action. So for the rest of our existence on, existence on this plane, we should be frustrated. What we do with that frustration is what matters. Yeah? Yeah. Right. Directing it. Yeah. Alchemy. There's a couple more questions coming in. Let me see. Oh, there are comments to say thank you. This is beautiful. Thank you, Jack. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you. Oh, my God. I can't believe. Y'all, I was so nervous. Also, because I... I think Castles is the most amazing artist on the planet. I'm like, shit, now I got to present in front of Castles and Rafa. Oh, you know, there it is again. Like, what if they don't like me at the end of my presentation? But Blau, how do you like me now? We love you, Jackie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Always love you. This was Thank a, you. amazing to go out. Yes. 
Thanks. Thanks for bringing it as you always do. And just I like you, from the heart, you know, I think um, having like often, you know, lectures are, we're, we're taught that lectures are supposed to be like, um, just like extremely cool and formal. And the fact that you're, uh, you have so much like content, but also so much vulnerability, honesty, and rigor and imagination. It's like, it's beautiful. And um, I'm really glad for everybody to get to meet you here tonight. And uh, we're, our class is going to be really psyched. I know every one of my students has something they're going to want to ask you. Um, so, so thank you so much. And yeah. thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, SU. Yeah. Thank you, Sam Van Aken. Thank you, everyone, for making this up. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you, all the in plain sight artists, all the activist organizers, everybody who's come together to make this moment possible. We thank you so very much. And uh, lots of love to you, Jackie. I hope to see you very soon. You will. And, uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom. Well, indeed. Yeah, we got to support Rafa. Yes. Off to the next lecture. Bye, y'all. So much good night, everyone. Thank you can find you. Bye, 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 bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank thanks you for breaking us open. Yes, thanks for your uh, undying support with AV and everything. You've made it, made it run so smoothly all these weeks. Thanks so much, Jess. Yeah. Right. <laughs> cool. Pleasure. All right.